Chapter 19. Man, ever since he heard me call my mama's name, Herman E. Calloway had locked himself up in his room and wouldn't come out. Mr. Jimmy and Miss Thomas made me sit at the kitchen table whilst they knocked on his door and tried to talk to him into opening it up. But the way they kept saying Herman, soft at first, then louder and louder, it sounded like he wasn't talking back. After the longest while, they decided to let the big baby have his own way and come back downstairs. They say at the kitchen table with they sat at the kitchen table with me. Miss Thomas looked at me and said, My, my, my. Mr. Jimmy said, Now look here, bud. He wiped his hand over his face. You're sure your mama's name was Angela Janet? I said, Yes, sir. And the two of you both had the same last name. Her last name was Caldwell, too. She never said nothing about being no Calloway. I spelt it out for him. No, sir, her name was Caldwell. C-A-L-D-W-E-L-L. -L. It seemed like he finally believed me. He said, Okay. I hope you don't mind me asking, bud, but it's pretty important that we know. How'd your mama pass, and how long ago was it? Pass was just like gone. It was another one of those words grown folks use instead of dead. I said, I was six years old when it happened, sir. I don't know why. She was too sick to go to work for six days in a row. Then one morning I went into her room and she was dead. But she didn't suffer nothing. It happened real quick. She didn't even have time to close her eyes. She didn't, have, she didn't look like it hurt or nothing. Miss Thomas reached across the table and touched my arm and she said, I'm sure it didn't, bud. I'm sure it was very peaceful for her. Mr. Jimmy said, When she was living, bud, God rest her soul, what'd your mama look like? This was another strange question, but before I could answer, Miss Thomas said, James, what are you insinuating? I knew there was something familiar about this boy. I don't know how I missed it before, but look at Bud's eyes. You have to, a you have to ask if this is Herman's grandchild? Mr. Jimmy said, Now hold on, Grace. I'm just trying to ask the questions I know Herman asked if he could. Ain't a thing wrong with being certain before we jump to any conclusions. Now what'd she look like, son? I said, She was real pretty, sir. Mr. Jimmy said, I bet she was, Bud, but that ain't what I meant. Was she short or tall? Was she slim or big-boned? I said, I don't know, sir. She was real pretty and real tall and kind of skinny like me, I guess. Miss Thomas said, James, Bud was six years old. Everyone on earth was real tall to him. I don't see the point in all this. I said, pardon me, ma'am. I know how I can show you what she looks like. I still got her picture. She just stared at me. I said, can I be excused? Miss Thomas said, yes, son. Hurry up and go get that picture. I busted up the stairs but stopped like I hit a brick wall. I remember how mad and crazy Herman E. Calloway looked when he yelled at me. I tippy-toed up the rest of the steps. Uh-oh. Herman E. Calloway's door was opened up a crack. I held my breath and tiptoed extra quiet and extra fast right into the little dead girl's room. And as soon as I did, whoop, zoop, sloop, my heart jumped down into my stomach. Herman E. Calloway was sitting on that little chair in front of the mirror on the dressing table. His elbows were on the table and his face was covered by his hands. It sounded like he was having trouble breathing because every time he sucked in a bunch of air, he made a sound like, Ugh. and every time he blew out the air, it sounded like, Ugh. I didn't know what to do. I could tell Mr. C didn't know I was in the room with him, so I could probably just backward tiptoe and get out of there without anything happening. I rose up on my toes, took two baby steps back, and stopped. Shucks. I'd come up here to show Miss Thomas and Mr. Jimmy what my mama looked like. There wasn't nothing wrong with that. I wasn't doing nothing that meant I had to sneak out of this room on my tiptoes going backwards. I sucked in a mouthful of air and walked over to my bed. I picked up my sax case and set it on top of the bed. I pushed the two silver buttons to the side and the two silver tongues jumped open and made those loud click-click sounds. Hermony Calloway still didn't take his face out of his hands. He kept going. I reached inside my sax case and took out the envelope with Mama's picture in it. I closed the two silver tongues again and could tell that Mr. C wasn't paying no mind at all. He kept his face in his hands and his head was rocking up and down real slow, sort of like he was checking to see how much it weighed. I put my sax back in next to the bed and was about to leave the room when I looked over at Hermony Calloway's back. He still didn't know I was in the room with him. I looked in the little brown mirror and still couldn't see his face, but I could see his hands a lot better. I could see six little trails of water coming out from where his fingers joined up with his hands, with three trails from each hand joined up together on his wrist, and ran down his arms, puddling on top of the dressing table. 
Shucks, Hermione Calloway was bawling his eyes out. He was acting like me. Being his grandson was the worst news anyone could ever give you in your life. This was number 39 of Bud Caldwell's Rules and Things You Have to Have a Funner Life and Make a Better Liar Out of Yourself. Rules and Things number 39. The older you get, the worse something has to be to make you cry. With babies, it's easy not to pay them no mind because crying's just like talking for a baby. A baby's tears might mean, hey, you just got stuck a pin. Hey, you just stuck a pin in my behind when you changed my diapers. Or their crying might be the way they picked out to say, good morning, mama. We're go- what are we going to do today? That makes it easy not to care too much about a baby's tears. When you got an old person crying, you got a whole nother story. When you got someone as old as Hermione Calloway crying, you better look around because you know you're square in the middle of one of those boiling tragedies. You can't help but feel sorry for him, even if it's he's been mean to you from the minute he first had eyes on you, even if he's crying because he found out the two of you were kin. I walked over to Hermione Calloway before I could think my hand moved out toward his back. I waited for one of those spaces between his ma's and his uhs, and then I touched him. His skin under his shirt was very, very warm. It took a second for Herman E. Calloway to know someone was touching him. When he knew, I felt his skin jerk and twitch the same way a horse's does when a fly lands on it. He whipped his head around. When he saw it was me, he jerked away, took one more giant huh, then stared. His mouth started moving like he was talking in a secret language only dogs could hear. At last, real American words started coming out of his mouth. He said, I, I, how, I'm, I'm, so, look, buddy, I, I just... It's not Bud. It's Bud, sir. Not Buddy. He put his face back in his hands and broke down all over again. Man, it's a good thing the thug wasn't around, because if he'd heard the way Mr. C was weeping, no one would have wondered who the real waterwork Willie was. I put my hand back on Mr. C's shoulder and patted him and rubbed him a couple of times, then left the room. It felt a lot better going out frontwards instead of sneaking out backwards. I ran down the steps back into the kitchen. Miss Thomas's and Mr. Jimmy's eyes jumped right onto my envelope. I set it in the middle of the table. Both of them just looked at it before Miss Thomas reached out and picked it up. She went into the pocket of her dress and took some funny little glasses that only had a bottom half to them, then put them on her nose. She pulled Mama's picture out and held it as far away from her eyes as she would stretch. She looked at the picture, looked over her glasses at me, then looked right at Mr. Jimmy and said, Any more questions for this young man? She slid the picture over to him. Mr. Jimmy picked it up and said, Well, I'll be... Remember that old con man who used to drag that ruined horse through town? Now what was his name? Help me out here, Grace. Didn't he call his act Joey Pegas and his broke back bronc- bronking bucko? Miss Thomas said, It was Joey Pegas and his broke back bucking bronco, James. What else do you see in the picture? Mr. Jimmy said, Uh-huh, huh. That definitely is Angela Janet Calloway. He looked at me and said, You sure this is your mother? I said, yes, sir, but her name's Caldwell, not Calloway. He said, well, I'll just be. Miss Thomas butted in on him. There's little doubt about that, James, but what we've got to do. She kept on talking, but I quit listening because something just came out of the blue and gave me a good whoop right on my forehead. Without even thinking about what I was doing, I butted in on Miss Thomas and said, that means that's not some dead little dead girl's room I'm sleeping in. That's my mama's room. She looked at me kind of surprised like this was the first time she'd had that thought, too. She said, that's right, bud. You're back in your mama's room. I said, how come Hermione Calloway never called on me and my mother? All he'd have to do was call on us one time, and I know she would have had been so sad. She wouldn't have been so sad. Miss Thomas and Mr. Jimmy took turns shooting quick looks at each other. Then she said, bud, give me your hand. Uh Uh-oh. Pretty soon I'd have to come up with the rules and things about when Miss Thomas holds your hand. She stretched out her arm across the table and held on to her fingers. Bud, she said, Mr. C, excuse me, your granddad didn't know anything about you. No one knew where your mother had gone. Mr. Jimmy said, that's right, son. She just up and run off to that one day. I mean, we all knew Herman was hard on her, but it wasn't like it was nothing personal. He was hard on everybody. I used to tell him all the time to slack off some on the girl, to go easy. But I can remember his exact words. He said, easy go, don't make the mare run. This is a hard world, especially for a Negro woman. There's a hundred different, there's a hundred million folks out there of every shades and hue, both male and female, who are just dying to be harder on her than I ever could be. She's got to be ready. Shoot, I could see the girl wasn't the type to. 
Miss Thomas said, James, why don't you go up and check on Mr. Herman? She said, why don't you? But it wasn't a question. Mr. Jimmy said, oh, well, maybe I should, and left the kitchen. Miss Thomas told me, bud, I know you can see your granddad has troubles getting along with most folks, right? Yes, ma'am. I think it's because he expects so much out of everybody, himself included. And when you set your standards so high, you, got, you get let down a lot. I shook my head up and down, acting like I understood. She said, now take your mother, for instance. He was so, so proud of that young woman, and he loved her very, very much. He was determined that she was going to be the first Callaway to get schooling all the way through college. So he thought he had to be strict on her. But he went overboard, bud. Simple as that. He used to crow about how his mother and father had been born slaves and how now it was only two generations later that the Calloways had come so far and worked so hard that one of them was actually going to be a teacher. It was his dream, not hers. Not yet, anyway. And he never gave her time to pick it for herself. The more he pushed her, the more she fought him. Finally got to be too much, and she left. We think she ran off with one of Herman's drummers. We've been hoping for 11 years that she'd send word for her or come home, and she'd and she finally has. Looks to me like she sent us the best word she'd, we'd have in years. Miss Thomas smiled at me, and I knew she was trying to say I was the word that my mama had sent to them. She said, wait here for one second, precious. I've got to go to my room for something. Miss Thomas was probably saying that as a excuse so she could blow her nose and cry, but she came back in a flash. She was holding an iron picture frame and handed it to me. This has been on my dressing table for 13 years, bud, ever since your mother was 16 years old. Now it belongs to you. I wanted to say thank you, but I just stared at the picture in the heavy iron frame. It was Mama. The picture only showed her head all around the edges. It was smoky or foggy, so, that's, so that it looked like Mama poked her head out of a cloud. And Mama was smiling, same soft smile she'd give me when she got home from work. It had been so long since I'd seen Mama smile that I wanted to laugh and cry at the same time. Miss Thomas said, let me show you something, bud. She took the frame out of my hands and said, watch this. She moved the picture up and down, right and left, then around in circles. Did you see how her eyes are on you all the time? No matter which way you look at the picture, she's watching. It seemed like Mama was looking direct at me no matter where Miss Thomas put the picture. I can keep this? I feel like I've been holding on to it until the rightful owner came along, and it looks to me like he's finally shown up. What took you so long, child? Miss Thomas patted me underneath my chin. She said, but bud, I've got a problem I'm going to need your help with. Uh-oh. You said you were six years old when your mother died. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so that was four years ago. Yes, ma'am. You can remember how bad you felt when you first knew she was gone, can't you? Yes, ma'am, because it still feels the same. Well, you've had over, you've had four years to, to heal that scar, but it still hurts some of the time, doesn't it? Sometimes a lot. I know, but remember, your grandfather and I just found out that she passed. The hurt is brand new for us. Miss Thomas started swallowing. And even though he hasn't seen her in 11 years, I know there isn't a day that goes by that he doesn't think about her. He'd never admit it, but there isn't one show that we give that he doesn't look first out into the audience, not to see how big the crowd is, but hoping that she'll be out there, hoping that she'd have seen a flyer tacked to a telephone pole somewhere and would stop by to see him. He loved her so much, bud. Sorry, sweetheart. She took the hand she wasn't squeezing my fingers with and took out a handkerchief and blew her nose. Those stones that he picks up everywhere he performs are for her. She must have been four or five years old. The band was getting ready to travel to Chicago for a week, and before we left, he asked her what she wanted him to bring back for her. He was thinking a doll or a dress or something, but she told him, A walk, Daddy. Bring me back a walk from Chicago. So everywhere we went, after that, he'd had to get her a walk. He'd write the city and the day we were there on there from them. He's got boxes of them upstairs, 11 years worth. So, but I don't know how Herman is going to be feeling after this. That's where I need your help. You've got to remember that both Herman and I love your mother just as much as you do. This didn't seem like it could be true. Not just because it didn't seem like anyone could love my mother as much as I do, but because it didn't seem like Herman E. Calloway could love anyone at all. Miss Thomas said, so if you can remember, bud, be patient with him. The ornery man upstairs is very, very hurt right now, and I just can't say where he's going to land 
After this news gets through blowing him around, Miss Thomas was starting to do the stingy eyed lingy blinking. So we're going to have to give him some time. We're going to have to let him find out who, how he feels before. Mr. Jimmy came into the kitchen. Grace, he said, he wants you. Hermony e. Calloway was making everybody feel like they had the blues. It looked like Mr. Jimmy to just wipe some tears from his eyes, too. Miss Thomas came around to my side on the table and gave me a hug. She said, you okay? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, should I go see how he's doing? Yes, ma'am. She left the kitchen and Mr. Jimmy went into the living room. <clears throat> I picked Mama's picture up and put it back in the envelope. Mr. C chose a good name for this house because not a second went by before the back door came open and the dusky devastators in the Depression walked in, talking like it was going out of style. As soon as they saw me, they all got quiet. Doo-doo Bug said, Hey, sleepy LeBone, where's everybody at? I didn't want to embarrass anyone by saying that all the grown folks were sitting all over the house, sobbing their eyes out, so I said, They're around. I remember not to call the band, sir. Steady said, Well, it's you we wanted anyway. He put an old cardboard suitcase on the table and said, I told the fellas how hard you've been hitting that recorder and how proud I was of you, so we put a couple of nickels together. He acted like he was yelling into the other room. And Lord knows on the peanuts we get it was a real sacrifice. He slapped some skin with dirty deed, then started talking regular again. Anyway, the thug saw something at the pawn shop and we picked it up for you. Can I open it? The thug said. Well, if you don't, I don't know who will. Eddie slid the cardboard suitcase over in front of me. It looked worse than the one I used to carry around. One of the snaps on it was busted clean off the other, and one was stuck. Steady Eddie said, it's what's inside that's interesting. Just pull out the snap real hard. I pulled on the snap and it came off right in my, my hand. The thug said, I knew it. The boy's just too country. He ain't used to handling fine merchandise. We should have given it to him in a paper bag. I opened the suitcase. Whatever it was was wrapped up in crinkly, wrinkly newspapers. I started pulling newspapers off and could tell that their gift was real heavy. All of a sudden, a shiny piece of gold showed through. I snatched more paper off and couldn't believe my eyes. The dusky devastators in the Depression had put their money together, had, had bought me a baby-sized horn like Steady Eddie's saxophone. Steady Eddie could see I was stuck, so he lifted out the suitcase and finished around in the bag for its mouthpiece, mouthpiece the neck and the reed holder. He took the reed for a minute, then put the horn together, then played it. Murr, my horn, had sounded great. Eddie said, it's an alto, bud. There's a little rust in some of the seams, but that's to be accepted with a horn that's old. It's still got a good tone to it. This dent didn't do her off too much. He showed me a big dent in the bottom part of my saxophone. I repatted, refelted, and resprung it. The, res <clears throat> the rest is up to you. He reached in his pocket and took out a can that said Brasso on the side. Get you a rag and shine her up. A man should polish his own horn. I looked at my bandmates and said, Thank you, thank you very, very much. I'll practice on this so much it'll be just good as you guys are in about three weeks. Doo-doo Bug said, Oh, now that's cold. I said, Really? I will. The band laughed, so I did too. And he said, Well, Mr. LeBone, I'll tell you what. Since you're so hot to get in this band, I'll better get you started on your lessons right away. He pulled a big silver watch that was tied up to a long chain out of his pocket and said, I'm going by for a while now, but I'll be back around seven. If you got your axe polished up by then, I'll bring you some sheet music along and we can get started. Sound good? His toothpick jumped with each word. Sounds great, Steady. Eddie took the strap off his neck and handed it to me. I put it on and Eddie handed me the saxophone for the very first time. It was the perfect weight. I said, can I be excused? Dirty Deed said, what, you ain't going to blow us some notes? We want to hear what you got, Mr. Three Weeks from Now. He said, I'll, I'll let you hear me in three weeks when we're all on stage together. He laughed again, and Thug said, I'ma let you in on something, Sleepy LeBone. There's a certain members of this band that you will be out playing in three weeks, but it's going to take you a whole lot longer to top me. On the real tip, it's going to take you at least ten years before you'll be able to even hold my drumsticks. Steady Eddie said, Yeah, and that's about nine years and ten months longer than you'll be with the band, Thug. The Thug said, Aw, man, you ain't going to start that up again. you got to let me know what you heard. I said, Can I be excused? And he said, head on, sleepy LeBone, I'll be back. I told my bandmates, thank you again, thank you very, very much. The thug said, nothing to it, little man. Dirty Deed said, now don't let that horn whip you, hmm? Doo, Doo Bug said, our pleasure, sleepy. Steady Eddie said, man, get out of here. I picked up both Mama's pictures, my horn, and the can of Brasso and ran up the stairs. 
When I got upstairs, I saw that Hermione Calloway's door was still open a crack. Miss Thomas's door was closed now, and I could hear the two of them in her room, talking real soft to each other. I could have stood outside the door and listened if I wanted to, but that would have been rude. Besides, I didn't know for sure how long it would take me to polish up my new horn. I went into my mother's room and put my sacks on the bed that Mama used to sleep in when she was a little girl. I put her smiling picture on the dressing table, then reached under her bed and pulled my sacks case out again. I snapped the two silver snaps and started talking, taking out all of my things. I took my old blanket out and remade my bed with it. I wasn't going to need to carry it around with me anymore. I opened the tobacco pouch and took out the rock that said flint on it and set it on my bed. I took the pouch and the flyers and walked down the hall to Hermione Calloway's room. Even though I could still hear him and Miss Thomas talking and boo-hooing in her room, I knocked on his door anyway. When no one answered, I opened it. He had one of those dressing tables with a mirror stuck on the back of it, too. So I walked real quick over to it and set the flyers and the bag of four rocks down. I got out of his room as fast as I could. Phew! Even though it was me who'd carried them around all these years... You'd have to be a pretty big liar if you'd say those rocks and flyers really belonged to me. Hermione Calloway's name was all over the flyers, and his writing was all over the rocks. Besides, the way he looked so shook up when he saw those rocks for the first time, I figured they meant more to him than they did to me anyway. I went back over to Mama's dressing table and opened the little drawer. I took one of the thumbtacks out and went back to Mama's bed. Next, I took out the envelope that had her picture in it. I took out the picture of her riding the sad, saggy pony. I still couldn't see... <clears throat> What she was so unhappy about, the Miss B got in Moon Park looked like somewhere you could have a lot of fun. I poked the thumbtack into the top of Mama's picture and walked to the wall that she'd stuck all the pictures on, of horses on. I put Mama right amongst all those ponies and horses she liked so much. I didn't need to carry that doggone picture around. This wasn't how I remembered Mama anyway. Mama was always excited and jumpy, not sad and pokey like this little girl. Mama was kind of old when I met her, too. She wasn't young like this picture at all. The picture looked like it belonged. It's strange the way things turn out. Here I'd been carrying Mama around for all this time and I'd finally put her somewhere where she wanted to be, back in her own bedroom, back amongst all of her horses. I went back to bed and picked the flint rock up. It was going to be enough. I didn't need those other things with me all the time. I didn't need them to remind me of Mama. I couldn't think about her anymore. If there were a hundred hours in every day and a thousand days in every week, I couldn't think of my mama any better than I already do. All I have to do is remember her hand on my forehead when she'd ask me something like, Baby, are you sick? Have you got a temperature? All I have to do is remember mama letting me dry the dishes after she'd washed them. How she used to say no. No one in the world would dry a plate the way I could. All I'd have to do is take two or three deep breaths and think of the books she'd read to me at night. And remember that no matter how long it took, she'd read until I went to sleep. Days of Malone was right. I was carrying Mama inside me, and there wasn't anything or anything, anyone or anything that could take away that from that or add to it either. The one rock from Flint could be enough. I set it in my sax case. I picked up my saxophone. It was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. I wet the reed the same way I'd seen Steady Eddie do, then clamped it on the mouthpiece. I closed my eyes and counted to ten. If after I got to ten I blew the horn and it sounded pretty good, I knew I'd be playing along with Dusky Devastators and the depression in a week or two. If I didn't sound so good, it meant I'd have to practice for a couple of months before I'd be good enough to go out and get on stage with them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. <clears throat> I puffed my cheeks and blew as hard as I could. <clears throat> the saxophone only squeaked, squawked, and groaned, then sounded like it was making up words like a wonk and rusica and balupa. Shucks, maybe I didn't puff my cheeks out right. Maybe I was blowing too hard. I counted again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. This time the horn only squeaked, squawked, and groaned. It didn't sound like it was trying to make up any words. It sounded great. It wasn't perfect, like when Steady blew it. But I could tell that one day it was going to be something told me I could learn how to play this. Something told me that those sounds were more than just bad notes. If you didn't have a real good imagination, you'd probably think those noises were the sounds of some kid blowing a horn for the first time. But I knew better than that. I could tell those were the squeaks and squawks of one door closing and another door opening. I looked at the picture of Mama and Miss Thomas gave me. Mama was looking right at me with that same soft smile. I know it's stupid to smile back at a picture, but I couldn't help myself. I know it's even stupider to talk to a picture, especially when it hadn't said anything to start a conversation. But I had to say, 
Here we go again, Mama. Only this time, I can't wait. I closed my eyes again and began practicing. Shucks, as good as things were going for me now, I'd bet you dollars to donuts that Steady Eddie was going to get here early. <laughs>